Okay, so today we're going to be looking at section 3.1, which is talking about how to find the derivative of polynomials and power functions. So what we have been doing is that we've been finding the derivative of a function f of x, which we have been calling f prime, which you can also call d of f of x divided by dx. Remember, the d stands for um, the change of your function divided by the change of your x variable which is also called dy over dx, so how y is changing as x changes. And we've been using either two different limit definitions of the derivative, either the limit of f of x minus f of a over x minus a as x approaches a, or the limit as h approaches 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a divided by h. Now, here is why chapter 3 is probably my favorite chapter and so cool is because instead of having to use these limit definitions, now we just get these really quick, awesome rules. So let's go ahead and go through these rules and see why some of them work. So first, if c is a constant, then the derivative of a constant function is going to be 0. The reason is, is because if you graph a constant function, it's just a straight line, which means that it's going to have a slope equal to zero. The next one states that if you're raising a function x to an n power, then the derivative is going to bring that power down in front and then subtract one from that power. So remember the power comes down in front, then the new power is that power minus one. If you're multiplying a function by a constant, then what you can do is you can kick that constant outside and then just take the derivative of the function. The reason why is because if you have a function like so, and let's say that you're finding the slope of the tangent line here, if you multiply it by a constant, what that does is that it takes your function and it stretches it out, and it also stretches the slope out at the same rate. If you're adding or subtracting two functions and you're taking the derivative, then you can take the derivative of each piece individually and add and subtract those. Last but not least, which is probably one of my favorite derivative rules of all time, is that the derivative of the function e to the x, that's the exponential function, the natural number e, is just itself, e to the x. Also, before we get started, I just wanted to remind you guys of a couple of rules of exponents. So, if you're multiplying two things together that have the same base, but they have different exponents, or even the same exponent, what you do is that you add those exponents together. Now, because division is the opposite of multiplication, if you're dividing two functions of the same base, then their exponents are going to subtract. If you're taking the nth root of a function x, then that's the same as x to the 1 over n, so it becomes a fraction. Same thing if you have nth root of x to the m, then that can be written as x to the m over n. And if you have an exponent and a denominator, you can bring it out of the denominator by making it a negative exponent. So, let's go ahead and look at a couple of examples here. So, let's use the definition and then use the derivative rules to find f prime of 2 given f of x equals x. Let's make that square just to make our life a little bit easier x squared plus 3x minus 1. So if we use one of our limit definitions, okay, let's go ahead and do the limit as h approaches 0, okay, and that would be x plus h squared plus 3 times x plus h minus 1 minus x squared plus 3x minus 1 all divided by h. So what I'm doing is I'm using the formula from section 2.7. So if I expand this out, what I'm going to get is x squared plus 2xh plus h squared plus 3x plus 3h minus 1 minus, now remember I have to distribute that negative to each piece of my function, so it's going to be minus x squared minus 3x plus 1 all over h. All right, now what we're going to do is look for some nice cancellation. So that x squared is going to cancel out with the negative x squared. Okay, the 3x will cancel out with that 3x. 
that negative 1 will cancel out with that 1. As well, notice that each term has a h. So if we take that h and we factor it out, we are going to get the limit as h approaches 0 of h times 2x plus h plus 3 divided by h. Those h's will cancel out. And what we will be left with is 2x plus h plus 3. Remember, h is going to 0, so what this is actually going to be is just 2x plus 3. And that's going to be our f prime of x. Now, if I plug 2 into my derivative, f prime of 2, I'll get 2 times 2 plus 3, which will give me 7. So what I just did here is that that was using the definition. So using that definition would be right here. Now, if I want to use these cool rules that I just gave you guys up here, let's go ahead and do that. So if I wanted to take the derivative of the function f of x equals x squared plus 3x minus 1, Well, f prime of x would be, well, since each of these pieces are being added or subtracted, I could just look at taking the derivative of each piece individually. So using that power rule, that's the uh, second rule we have up there, if I have x squared, that 2 is going to come down in front, and that's going to give me 2x, and I'm going to subtract 1 from the exponent, so that would be to the first. Plus, now I'm going to take the derivative of this next piece. Remember, 3x, you can think of that as 3x to the first. Since I'm multiplying by 3, the 3 is just going to hang out. That is by the third rule right here. So I'm going to have 3 times, now the derivative of x to the first is going to be 1 times x to the... Now, if I have x to the first, I subtract 1 from the exponent, it's going to be x to the 0. Minus, then the derivative of 1, well, 1 is just a number, it's a constant, so what's its slope? Its slope is 0. So if I clean this up a little bit, I'm going to have f prime of x equals 2x plus 3. Now look here, the reason that is, is because x to the 0, anything to the 0 power is going to give you 1. Okay, So that's going to be 3 times 1 times 1, which will give you 3. Now what I can do is I can just plug that 2 in like I did above and get the same thing, which is 7. Now look at how much less work that was, right? All I had to do was move some stuff around. So let's continue to practice these with these following um, examples. So it says that we want to find the derivative of the following functions using the derivative rules. That means that we don't want to use the limit definition. So on this first one, I want to find the derivative of y equals the square root of x. Now before I start, I'm going to rewrite that as x to the 1 half. The reason is, is because that's the square root of x. And remember, by those power rules, I can rewrite it like this. So the derivative will be, well, I need to take that exponent and bring it down in front. And then it's going to be x to the, and then remember, I have to subtract 1 from that, so it's going to be x to the negative 1 half. Now, if you want to rewrite this for the homework, which you will want to, that would be 1 divided by 2 and remember, that's a negative exponent, so I can put in the denominator and make it positive 1 half, which would be the same thing as the square root of x. And that would be my answer. Now on the next one, don't have to rewrite anything. These look pretty straightforward. So if we're multiplying by a constant, that constant hangs out. And then we're just going to take the derivative of this piece with the x in it. So what's the derivative of x to the fifth? It would be 5x to the fourth. Remember, because that derivative makes that exponent come down in front, and then we have to subtract 1 from the exponent. Plus, the derivative of x to the first would be 1 times x to the 0 minus, and the derivative of 7, again, 7 is just a constant, so the derivative would be 0. Now again, we don't want to leave it like this, we want to clean it up, so this would be 15x to the fourth plus 
great. Now if we take the derivative of the next function, we do want to um, expand it out. And here's why. The reason why is because right here, I have two pieces being multiplied together. And nowhere in these rules that I set up at the very beginning did I say anything about two functions being multiplied. I did say if you're multiplying by a constant, you can leave the constant on front. And I did say if you're adding or subtracting, then you can take the derivative of each piece. What we're going to learn in the next section is that it's actually going to get more complicated if you're multiplying. So for right now, we need to expand that out before we take the derivative. So our function f of x is going to be e to the x plus 7x to the 6th minus 21x squared. And then when we take the derivative, the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. Plus, now the derivative on this one, we're going to bring that 6 down in front. So 6 times 7 is going to give us 42x to the 5th minus 42x. Again, remember, if you're multiplying your function by a constant, then that constant just hangs out in front. So this is so, so much easier than using the limit definition, isn't it? And this is so nice because now we have the derivative function. So if we want to find the derivative at multiple places or look at the derivative's behavior over a long period of time, now we have a cool function that will help us do that. All right, let's do a couple more examples. By the way, if you want to pause the video and just take a whack at these by yourself, feel free to do that. That would be awesome. Now this next one, d, we have g of x equals 10x to the 8th plus 4x to the 7th divided by 2x to the 5th. Now, here's the issue with this one, is that again, we're taking two pieces and dividing them. We didn't have a rule for taking the derivative if we're dividing two things. Again, that's going to show up in the next video, and you'll see that it's a little bit more time consuming um, than just taking the derivative of the top and the bottom, and that's not right anyway. So what we're going to do is that we're going to use this neat fact that if you have a fraction like a plus b divided by c, you can break it up into a over c plus b over c. So we're going to break this up and rewrite it as 10x to the 8th divided by 2x to the 5th plus 4x to the 7th divided by 2x to the 5th. Now the reason we can do that is because remember, usually we start with the right hand side and we try to find a common denominator so that we can rewrite it as the left hand side. But because there's an equal sign, we can go back and forth. So 2 over, or I'm sorry, 10 over 2 would give us 5. x to the 8th divided by x to the 5th. Remember, you're going to subtract those exponents, so that would give you x to the 3rd. Plus, and then here, 4 and 2 will give us 2. And x to the 7th divided by x to the 5th. Remember, those are going to subtract, so 7 minus 5 would give us x to the 2nd. So the derivative, remember we just wrote this so it would be a little bit simpler, we still haven't found the derivative, would be 15x squared plus 4x. Awesome. Now we're going to have to do something similar on the next example. So we have to rewrite this again so that it's easier for us to invoke those rules that we found above. So 1 over x to the third is going to be x to the negative third. Those are the same things. Minus 4, and that square root of x. Remember, square root of x is the same as x to the 1 half. And since it's the denominator, it's going to be x to the negative 1 half. So now let's go ahead and take the derivative. So the derivative h prime of x would be, we're going to bring that exponent down in front. So it's going to be negative 3 x to the and then we need to subtract 1. So negative 3 minus 1 would give us negative 4. On the second piece, we're going to have negative 4. If we bring that negative 1 half down in front, it's going to be negative 4 times negative 1 half. That'll give us a positive 2. x raised to the negative 1 half minus 1 is going to give us negative 3 halves. Again, if we want to rewrite this so that we don't have any negative or um, fractional exponents, here's what it would be. It would be negative 3 divided by 
x to the fourth. Remember, you can take that negative and rewrite as a positive if you put in the denominator. Plus two divided by, so we can make that negative three halves go away by putting that in the denominator. Okay, the three in the numerator, in the numerator, in the numerator means that we're raising this to the third power. The two in the denominator means that we're taking the square root. Okay, so either way you write these, if you're doing it on an exam, would be totally fine. If you're doing it on the homework, it's going to prefer that you write it this way. All right, last but not least, we want to find the derivative of y equals z to the 20th. Now, be careful. What you might think is, or not z, I'm sorry, 7 to the 20th. What you might think is, oh, I'm going to bring that 20 down in front, and then I'm going to subtract 1 from the exponent, and I'll be done. But here's the thing. 7 to the 20th is a number. So because there's no x value, it's just a constant function. There's nothing changing about it. So the derivative then, sneaky sneaky, is just going to be 0. Remember, there's no x, so nothing's changing. There's no variable. It's just a constant, even though it's a huge constant. All right, last example. So we want to find the equation of the tangent line given this function at the point p0, 3. So first we're going to take the derivative using those derivative rules from above. So the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. That 4 is going to hang out in front, and then we're going to bring the 3 exponent down, so it's going to be 12 x squared. And remember, the derivative of that 2, because it's a constant, is going to be 0. Now if we want to find the derivative, which is the slope of the tangent line, we want to find the slope of the tangent line at that point 0, 3. So we're going to plug 0 in to our derivative, and we're going to get e to the 0 plus 12 times 0 squared, which will give us 1. So remember, if we're plugging this in to our point-slope formula, we're going to have y minus 3, because that's the y value of the point we're given, equals 1 times x minus 0. So the slope of the tangent line then, if you want to re rewrite it in um, slope-intercept form, would be x plus 3. Now here's a nice way to check your answer, is that you can open up Desmos, graph this function, and make sure that this is the tangent line. So I'm going to go ahead and do that, and let's just confirm that we have the right answer. All right, so I've typed in our function, which is e to the x plus 4x cubed plus 2, and we want to confirm that we have the right tangent line. So remember, we're trying to find the line tangent to the point 0, 3, so that would be that point right there. So we found y equals x plus 3, and if I'm looking at this, I'm going to go ahead and put in projector mode so it's a little bit easier to see, it does in fact look like that line is very tangent to our function, so we did a great job. Now, let's say that you goofed up somewhere. It's going to be pretty quick for you to see that you goofed up, because if you got 2, for example, in front of your x, then you can say that's not tangent, right? It's going through our function instead of hugging it. Same thing if you accidentally had negative 3. Then what you're going to see is that our function doesn't hit our graph where it's supposed to. So I'm always a really big fan of checking your work by graphing your answer.